Welcome to Uncovered in the Archives. I'm your host, Brad Pomerantz. On today's episode, we uncover the history of the iconic Palm Springs Aerial Tramway. Now, while over 20 million people have ridden on this tram, it's over 50 years in existence, this engineering marvel was once called a folly and nearly derailed by politics, war, funding, and weather. How is this tram brought back from the brink? That's coming up on Uncovered in the Archives. Uncovered in the Archives is made possible in part by Loma Linda University Health. Additional support provided by Coachella Valley Water District, City of Riverside, County of Riverside, City of Hesperia, Steve Tobin and the Grace Helen Spearman Charitable Foundation, City of La Quinta, and by contributions to your PBS stations by viewers like you. Thank you. So we're inside the archives of the Palm Springs Aerial Tramway. We are joined by Jim Landles. He's an expert on the history of the tram. So I wanna ask you right out of the box, who was the first person, who was the visionary that thought, let's put a tram uh, up Chino Canyon? Well, as the story goes, that was Francis Crocker in about 1935. And the story I was told is that they were driving with a friend of his, Warren, okay. heading out of town and he pointed up in the mountain, he says, you know, they need to have a tram up that mountain. What's remarkable about his vision is that word got out, and I actually spent some time in the archives before we came together, and I looked at an article, and all of a sudden, we saw repeated reference to Crocker's Folly. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was getting lambasted for his idea to put a tram well, up Well, it Chino just Canyon. seemed impossible to, to most people that it could even be accomplished. Then I understand that Mr. Crocker uh, was able to enlist the help of a very prominent individual in the Absolutely. Coachella Valley. Who yes, was that? Uh, yes, that would be Earl Kaufman. He was the owner and operator of the Desert Inn, and he foresaw Palm Springs as being a huge resort area. Right. Around that time, once that momentum started to build, I guess from what I read in the archives, that legislation was needed through the state of California to allow even the planning Absolutely, of yes. a tram up Chino Canyon, but it didn't go well in Sacramento. No, it did not. The bills were vetoed by the governor. Twice. Twice. Twice, I understand. The governor at the time, uh, Colbert Olson, vetoed two different bills to make matters even more frustrating for these pioneers, a World War II broke out. Right. And what did that right. do? Let's put it back the time clock yet again. Here we are. So what happened at the end of World War II? Well, Bill was reintroduced, and the governor of the day, fortunately, signed it, and we were on our way. Okay, that's Earl Warren, who wound yes, up going Earl to the Warren. U.S. Supreme Court in 1945. He signed that enabling legislation. So as I was rifling through the archives, I like looking at newspaper articles, I found one that said that the tram would be done by 1947. Impossible. Not so much. <laughs> what made it even more impossible was another military conflict. Right, Korean War. Korean War delayed the process yet, yet again. again. Yes. So once the Korean War ended, I understand that the momentum started to build again. Yes. Now, I've learned that the mountain, uh, Chino Canyon, is owned by the California State Park System. But then there's the question of the land uh, at the entry. Yes. to what would become the Palm Springs Aerial Tramway. Right. Um, I presume that land was in private hands, is yes, that right? Yes, it was, yes. Who can I speak with, Jim, that could help us explore the question of the acquisition of land here at the floor of this valley? Well, there's one man that comes to mind, and that would be Steve Nichols. Okay. I believe his father was instrumental in that. Okay, let's go meet Steve Nichols. Steve Nichol, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Before we learn about your family's connection to the tram, I see you brought a prop. What'd you bring? Well, I brought an article from the uh, Palm Springs Desert Sun from May of 1940 
that features on the front page the possibility of a tramway in this canyon. So that's about five years after Francis Crocker dreamed up this vision of a tram. Mm -hmm. The tram had been called Crocker's Folly for a time, but by the end of the 50s, it looked like the tram was building momentum. I saw in the archives uh, private revenue bonds, $8.15 million in private revenue bonds, no public monies whatsoever. What's your family's connection to those private revenue bonds? Well, uh, my family, along with many other uh, folks, bought some of those bonds. And uh, my family was also connected in ju just in terms of being involved in looking at the feasibility of the tramway. And let's talk way. about that. Your father, his name is Culver Nickel. Tell me more about his involvement as it relates to the creation, the vision of the Palm Springs Aerial Tramway. Well, I think you could call him uh, one of the dreamers of the tramway, like Crocker and like Earl Kaufman. Mm -hmm. In fact, my father actually uh, took it uh, one level further. He uh, made at least one trip and possibly two to Switzerland to actually ride on existing tramways. He did one more thing. Your family did one more thing. My grandparents uh, bought uh, this land from the Southern Pacific Railroad in the 1920s. This whole area that uh, we're at right now? A square mile here. Okay. Yeah. In the 50s, my father and mother donated this land to the tramway for the lower station. I must say, Steve, that it's just inspiring to think that the Valley Station is here today because of the generosity of your parents. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel proud and uh, it, uh, makes me wonder from time to time, would we be even standing here if it hadn't been for my grandparents and my parents doing what they did? And I want to ask you then, if I wanted to speak with someone who could tell me about the construction of the actual tram, any ideas who I could speak with? I have one idea, that would be Jim Landells, oh. who <laughs> was the son of Don Landells, who ran the helicopter. Right, we spoke with Jim earlier inside the archives. Maybe we can find him again and talk to him about the construction. Sounds good. Okay, let's do it. Let's go find Jim Landells. <laughs> Jim Landels is back. I gotta ask you, Jim, why did Steve Nichols tell me I should talk to you about the construction of the tram? I happen to have written a book in honor of my father detailing the construction of the Palm Springs Tramway. And here's the book right here. Yes, sir. Called We Can Do It. Uh, we see your dad's name, Don Landels. I wanna talk about the man, the myth, Don Landels, your father. What made him such a pivotal player in the construction of this tram? Well, Brad, uh, Don was one of the few pilots in Southern California that had the experience to fly this rugged terrain and it had experience uh, flying these newly powered uh, turbocharged, supercharged helicopters that had much greater lift capabilities. And that's the key to this story. But for these helicopters and the pilots that could fly them up Chino Canyon, there would be no Palm Springs Aerial Tramway. Absolutely true. The helicopters were pivotal in the construction. 95% of the materials delivered were delivered by helicopter. We are so lucky. We were in the archives before. Some genius decided to have a series of photographers take photographs uh, from the vantage point of the helicopter pilot. And some of these photographs are absolutely remarkable. They show the huge amount of materials and equipment that had to be brought up this mountain. I see pictures of these helicopters carrying huge slats of steel beams. Right, up to 20, 24 feet long. I couldn't believe when I saw imagery of a water tank, of fuel canisters, even tractors were hauled by helicopters up this mountain? A piece at a time, disassembled into 700 pound loads. And then there are all the workers that basically lived up there. Yep, they'd go up on Mondays and come back down on the weekends. They couldn't take the time to fly them up and down every day. So the helicopters had to bring up equipment to create a, a worker's village. Absolutely, that was their way in and their way out. Now, there was one day though that was pretty scary. Uh, December 10th, 1962, you discuss it in your book. What happened on that day that impacted your dad? Well, that was the day we had a mid-air crash. A flight plan change had been made, and the aircraft were going to be coming in and leaving from different directions. And it was believed that one of the pilots wasn't clear on that, because when my father lifted off his uh, pad to take off and turn, 
He met midair with an aircraft that was coming in to land. And we've seen pictures of the aftermath. The tremendous of, impact. Right, of that crash. The pilot in the other plane, very minor injuries. Your father? Not so lucky. Not so lucky. Uh, he survived, amen, a severe leg fracture, but continued his work. Your father also had really the honor to fly someone pretty high up in our state to inspect the construction of the tram. Who was that? That would be Edmund G. Brown. The governor. governor. The first Edmund G. Brown, Pat Brown, in the early 1960s. Absolutely. And his wife. Yes, he flew them up to the top and they walked around with the board from Palm Springs and took it all in and I think he really enjoyed the day. I want to ask you though, you were too young to have worked on the site. Yeah, I was. But do you know anyone that did that can tell us about those days? Oh, sure. That would be uh, Steve Nichols. Steve Nichols. Wait, we talked to Steve Nichols. Yeah, Steve. Steve's the guy. OK, let's go back and find Steve Nichols. He must still be here at the Palm Springs Aerial Tramway. Steve Nichols is back. Thanks for joining us again, sir. So Jim Landales told us that you actually worked at the construction site up at the mountain station, is that right? That's correct. In the summer of 1962, I worked up there for a few months and it was one of the best jobs I ever had. So how did you get to the mountain station? We took helicopters. So who flew you? Don Landells and uh, I think they had uh, three choppers uh, running at any one time and uh, that was one of the best rides you could ha have in Southern California. So Jim's dad flew you up to the mountain station in 1962. That's right. So Jim provided us with some imagery, some pictures from his archives of those helicopter rides. They are absolutely epic. I, I can only imagine how it must have felt incredibly empowering to be inside those helicopters heading up Chino Canyon. Well, it felt like you were flying in a bubble out over a deep canyon. There was the, the first the first time it was a bit scary. But I can after, imagine. After a while, you kind of look forward to it. It was a, a major, major experience. Not surprisingly, when we turn to the opening, the grand opening of the Palm Springs Aerial Tramway, your family was involved. September 12, 1963. What do you remember about that day? Well, my brothers and I, uh, Larry and Prescott, hiked in from Idlewild to meet the first car. Oh, really? And uh, it was a long, long hike just for some canapes and white wine. But so, it was... so that means you hiked, though, to the mountain station? To the mountain station from Idlewild. OK. And we got there. Uh, we had to kind of keep walking because we got there in time to meet the first tram car. And, and who was in the first or one of the first tram cars? My parents were in the car wow. and together with my sister-in-law and uh, my young niece. And let's look behind us. This could be the car. Amazing. Um, Amazing. Is, yeah. And in addition to your parents, many dignitaries were there. We found in the archives pictures of a governor, Mrs. Pat Brown. Right. He cut the ribbon, I think, right. Governor Brown. Yeah. Uh, Gene Autry, Art Linkletter. Uh, June Lockhart. I mean, it was a big day. A big day indeed. Yeah, it was amazing. It was, I, I just remember a huge celebration there at the Mountain Station. I want to talk about your family. In the 1920s, your grandparents bought land in Chino Canyon. In the 1950s, your parents donated that land so that this Valley Station could be built. The legacy continues with you. The legacy does continue. I, I had discussed with my father before he died creating a foundation f for, among other purposes, uh, land conservation. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, things that we've done that I'm most proud of is to uh, provide funding to acquire a key part of Chino, the, the interior of Chino Canyon for conservation purposes, such that people coming to the tramway will always be able to enjoy the natural undisturbed land rather than what might have been a hotel or other type of development there. I would be remiss if we didn't thank you for leaving that legacy for future generations. Steve, I really want to learn more about the miracle that is this civil engineering feat, the Palm Springs Tramway. Any ideas with whom I can speak? I think you should talk to Chris Barch, an engineer at the tramway. OK, let's go meet Mr. Barch. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. We're now joined by Chris Barch. He is the maintenance supervisor here at the Palm Springs Aerial Tramway. I want to speak with you about that tram. Yeah. It went online in 1963, but in 1998, something significant happened. What was that? Sure, the tramway contracted with Von Roll Tramways, a Swiss company, to manufacture the new rotating tram car. 
In addition to the new car, we know that there were new cables put in, a new drive system, rock removal. It's about a $15 million renovation. Uh, everything went back online in September 2000. Let's talk about the cabins. Yes. Uh, the iconic cabins of the 60s, 70s, 80s, no longer. New cabins. Yes. Tell us about them. The new cabins are the first in the Western Hemisphere and the only ones still wow. that rotate 360 degrees and actually do two rotations on the trip to the mountain. I want to ask you about the cables. You took me into the engine room, uh, an awesome site indeed. What were we looking at? We were looking at the drive system that runs the tram. We've got the electric motor, a gearbox, and then the bow wheel, which spins to pull the cable, pulling the tram car from the mountain down to the valley. And that motion pulls the other tram car up to the mountain. So there are 12 cables total, is that right? All together, yes, 12 separate. And how large are they? 16 millimeters, which is the communication line, to 75 millimeters, which is the ropes that hold up the counterweight for the track ropes. I want to ask you about the towers. There are five of them. How tall are they? Uh, the shortest one is 65 feet. That's tower number four. And the tallest one, tower number one, is 227 feet. What about the distance between the five towers? Uh, anywhere from about 700 feet to a mile and a half. Which makes sense because I believe the total tram ride is about two and a half miles. Yes. And how long does it take? Uh, about 10 minutes. And I want to take it. Can you uh, help me? I can. OK, how can I do it? How can yeah. I take the ride? Let's head on down. Ken Keetzer with the California State Parks is waiting there for you now. So uh, let's do let's it. Go. So we finally made it on to the Palm Springs Aerial Tramway. We are joined right now by Ken Keetzer. He's a senior environmental scientist with the California State Park System. And I understand, I've done some research before our trip, that there are several climate zones as we travel up the tramway. How many are there? Yeah, we run through five climate zones running up the tram. So zone one, goes from, is it Highway 111 when we enter to where we are right now? Uh, yeah, that's correct, just about that distance. And it's the northern end of the Sonoran Desert, which runs um, from right around Palm Springs all the way nearly to the southern tip of Baja, Mexico. Oh, wow. And so there are, it's at about 2,600 feet in elevation. What do we see in Zone 1 in terms of the fauna? The, the animal life. You're a zoologist. Yeah. What, what do we see? Yeah, well, um, if you're lucky, you'll see the um, peninsular bighorn sheep, the desert bighorn right. sheep, um, which is the, the icon of the area, sure. a federally endangered species. So some of the other wildlife you might see are a couple of foxes, the uh. kit fox and the gray fox. These are things you got to be really lucky to see. What about the flora, the plant life in this zone one, the Cienega zone? Yeah, the Sienega is a wetland, so you have riparian vegetation, willows, cottonwoods, sycamores, and then the iconic uh, palm tree, the Washingtonia that everybody knows of from Palm Springs. Of course. And 29 palms and some of the other desert oases. So I thought we now move into zone two. Uh, we have, I'll call him the cable engineer Dave behind us. He is going to start the tram ride. And as we move into zone two, let's get a sense of what we're gonna see that's different from zone one. Dave, should we start? Okay. So now that we've left the valley station, we're heading into zone two. And zone two takes us from an elevation, I understand, of about 2,600 feet to about 4,100 feet. And it will conclude at the second tower. Talk to us about the fauna that we would see in zone two. Well, you're gonna still see, have, have some potential to see the desert bighorn sheep, but as you climb the mountain, you're gonna, not, they don't get up that high. What other life might we see, animal life? Well, if you're extremely lucky, you can see a mountain lion, you can start seeing deer, um, and you continue to see some of the foxes, and you might see the ringtail if you're out here by any chance at night. What about the geological formations? Um, at this elevation, you're gonna see a lot of uh, the metamorphic rock, former seabed, shallow sea that filled the Inland Empire. Really? So, Ken, we've arrived at the second tower, which means we're entering the third zone. 
elevation 4,100 feet to about 5,800 feet. What can you tell us about the fauna that we may see here? Well, you're gonna see a lot of the same stuff that you saw a little lower on the mountain, except for, as I said, the bighorn sheep does not get up this high. They're you're gone. You start to see things like gray squirrels. You might see some of the higher elevation birds. Um, if you look out the window of the tram, you might get the chance to see some of the the soaring species, the hawks, potentially a golden eagle. If you're really lucky, a peregrine falcon, some of the other birds on the mountain. What plant life would we see now that we're in zone three? You're gonna start to see some of the shrubby chaparral species, mountain mahogany, you might see a juniper or a pinion pine. Is the geology changing, the formations that we see, the rock? Yes, it is. Um, if, if you look out the front of the tram car here, you're gonna start to see more of the true granitic rock, the plutons that were pushed up to make the higher parts of the mountain. This rock can is incredibly majestic. The colors, the formation. Uh, I mean, I can see why people so enjoy coming up this cliff just to see the rocks that are just sheer and absolutely beautiful. So I see we're starting to see sprinkles of snow. It's cold enough now that when there's precipitation, it's gonna stick. Oh yeah, in the winter time, we can get quite a bit of snow at the higher elevations of the mountain. So we're now at the third tower and we're entering the fourth climate zone. That zone takes us from about 5,700 feet in elevation to about 7,500 feet in elevation. What can you tell us about this fourth climactic zone? So as we move into this fourth zone, you're gonna start to see some of the pine trees, um, as well as continuing to see some of the oaks and some of the chaparral species as well. Okay, Ken, we're now at tower four, which means we're entering the fifth climate zone. As I look outside, lots of snow, lots of plant life. We're about 7,500 feet in elevation, heading all the way to the top of the mountain, which takes us to about 8,500 feet, and then even beyond that to 10,000 feet. Yes, correct. So you're gonna start to see uh, white firs, Jeffrey pines, lodgepole pines, um, limber pines, and sugar pines. Ah, uh, what about animal life? We're gonna see a lot more birds. The Stellar's Jay is one of them. It's really um, vocal. It'll come harass you for your snacks. I like it. Um, you'll see the Clark's Nutcracker, which again is really squawky and loud and noticeable. Um, the white-headed woodpecker is one of the bird birders like to come up here and look for. So we're heading toward the mountain station, 8,500 feet in elevation. We have literally traveled on this tram I guess it's 6,000 feet. The ride took, oh, I don't know, about 10 minutes. Is that right, Dave? That's correct. About 10 minutes to get here. It is a marvel like none other. As we get out of the station, what are we gonna see? Well, you're gonna see the view of the mountain peak. You're gonna see the, the pine forest that, that we were talking about. Well, why don't we leave this cable car and let's take a look at what we can see at Mountain Station. Okay, Ken, we made it outside of the mountain station. It's cold. Yes, it is. 30 degrees. Correct. What's the differential from the valley station to the mountain station? Well, today it's about 20 degrees. It's in the 40s down in Palm Springs. Okay. It'll warm up later in the day. And um, sometimes it's as many as, as much as 40 degrees difference really? up here. So I want to talk more about the mountain station. A marvel in itself, built in the early 1960s. I can't believe they were able to do that, but we've learned that through the helicopter work of many people, all the materials were brought up here. Inside this three-story building, there's a restaurant. We can enjoy a meal. Uh, we can enjoy a hot toddy. It's cold. There are two theaters. We can watch films on the history of the tram, the history of the state parks, a gift shop, a nature exhibit. And let's talk about nature, your specialty. Sure. If we want to enjoy the nature that we see behind us, the majestic beauty of this mountain wilderness, what can we do? Well, a great thing to do would be have one of our state park interpreters or volunteers take you for a nature walk down here in Long Valley, right outside the tram building. Um, or you can hike into the wilderness, backpack into one of our wilderness campgrounds, uh, spend the night in the wilderness. It's a great thing to do. Can we ski? Is there cross-country skiing? Well, of course, seasonally, there's cross-country skiing, snowshoeing. 
in the summertime, there are miles and miles of hiking trails. You can hike to San Jacinto Peak, 10,834 feet. Uh, that's the highest point in the California State Park system. Ken, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. I want you to remember this. In 1935, a young electrical engineer looked up at the snow-capped peaks. He looked up at Mount San Jacinto, and he had a vision. He had a vision that one day, people would be able to ride a tram up the sheer cliffs of Chino Canyon. And you know what? 20 million people have done that. Crocker's Folly has become the eighth wonder of the world. We hope that you've enjoyed this journey through the history of the Palm Springs Aerial Tramway as much as we have. And we hope that you join us next time to see what we've uncovered in the archives. I'm Brad Pomerantz. in the archives is made possible in part by Loma Linda University Health. Additional support provided by Coachella Valley Water District, City of Riverside, County of Riverside, City of Hesperia, Steve Tobin and the Grace Helen Spearman Charitable Foundation, City of La Quinta, and by contributions to your PBS stations by viewers like you. Thank you.